Good to be here this morning. A man, a man. You wouldn't believe how I believe that. It is good to be here. God's been good to me. And uh, we're going to pick up now, continue with our study of, uh, I don't know, what do we call it? <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, I guess New Testament survey would be a good term for it. And uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into God's word. My Father, I pray, Lord, now for the gift of teaching. And Father, I pray that you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your word. Receive it not as the word of men, but as the word of God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to take these words, Father, these holy inspired words, and make them real and give life to the people who hear them. In thy name we pray, amen. amen. All right, now I talked about how the Jew is the key, understanding the Jew is the key that unlocks the understanding of the New Testament. And I showed you how that the book of Isaiah chapter number 6 has a prophecy that is quoted seven times in the New Testament and applied by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost to Israel in their blinding God judicially blinds them once they have rejected the Messiah. In the book of Romans chapter number 11, you'll find out this blinding has a direct relationship with Gentiles because Gentiles are mentioned time and time again in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. So the Gentiles and the Jews are connected throughout the Bible. You cannot disconnect them. And the Bible talks about the times of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles. And we're living during the times of the Gentiles and also the fullness of the Gentiles. The Jew is not prominent in the world. The Jew, though, although the Jew is the major object of prophecy in the Word of God. Then we got into the covenant. We talked about the covenant relationship. We talked about the, uh, the Greek word hakene diatheke. The word diatheke is translated covenant and testament in the New Testament. And uh, the word diatheke, as the, as the translators translated it, could be translated either way, covenant or testament. You say, is there a difference between a covenant and a testament? There's a nuance of difference. The testament is part of the covenant, no question, because there's only one covenant. There's only one blood covenant, and that's the blood covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you cannot have your sins forgiven apart from that. But the testament is a uh, is what you might call an ancillary or a or a or a or a side view of the Gentiles being partakers of the new covenant without exhausting and completely fulfilling the new covenant, because the new covenant will never be exhausted and completely fulfilled until the Jew accepts that new covenant in in the book of Hebrews chapter number eight. And when you go to Hebrews 8, you'll see what I'm talking about because the translators, the, uh, the author, the author of Hebrews uses the word diatheke, but the translators, King James translators, Anglican baby sprinklers uh, from Great Britain, and no doubt, and I'm not, this is not to disparage these men, no question, born again believers that love the Lord Jesus, but their eschatology is different from yours. And you say, what's eschatology? Eschatology is from the Greek word eschatos, which has to do with last things, the doctrine of last things. So you can be, a, you can be an amillennial or postmillennial and go to heaven? Yes, sir. <laughs> you certainly can. You're going to get messed up with some of your doctrine, but it's not going to keep you out of heaven. But these baby-sprinkling, Anglican, amillennial, Church men, when they got to Hebrews, and this is important, when they got to Hebrews, translated diatheke, testament on one hand, and covenant on another. And when you look at Hebrews chapter number 8, there is no question that it is the application is to the Jew, to the house of Israel, the covenant, which is yet future. Yet in Hebrews chapter number 9, he said, the translator said plainly, without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. They were forced to use the word testament instead of covenant. So the word, I hope I didn't confuse you with all of that, but the bottom line is 
that the, uh, that, the, that, the, that the Bible is not a book written by man. It's a book written by God. He simply used human instrumentation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved. Theos nustos. God breathed the, words of the, the word of God as you have in your book now. Now, when you come to the Gospel of John, as I told you before, the Gospel of John, to me, now you can't prove this, but to me, is the last of the Gospels written, written by the last of the apostles who outlived all the rest of them, the Apostle John. And the Gospel of John's probably written about the same time, somewhere along about the time of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, which would make it 90 to 95 A.D., which would mean that the Gospel of John is written after the Jews had rejected Christ, had been blinded, and that the Gospel now had been given to the Gentiles, as Paul said in Acts 28, the gospel is now going to the Gentiles and they'll hear it. And they have heard it. And we have for 2,000 years. You're going to find in the ninth chapter of the gospel of John, one of the most remarkable, uh, remarkable chapters that condenses all of this stuff that I'm talking about into one chapter and has to do with a miracle and the miraculous giving of sight, not restoration, because he was born blind, but the giving of sight to one born blind. And the ninth chapter of the book of John does this. The book of John, therefore, being written when it's written, to whom it's written, it's time and chronology, has lessons to be learned from it that will, that will add to what you get from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that's what we're dealing with this morning. Turn to John chapter number 9. Before you get there, turn to John 8. John chapter number 8, and you'll notice this is, the, uh, this is the context and the preparation for what you're going to read in John 9. The Lord Jesus Christ has just had a scathing confrontation with the Jews, and he has called them liars. And, uh, of course, they don't like that. Verse number 55, John 8, 55, I shall be a liar like unto you. Can you imagine how that offended their sensibilities, being uh, self-righteous as they were? But in verse number 56, he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and it was glad. And then said the Jews to him, Thou art yet fifty years old. How in the world? <laughs> how, in the, how hast thou seen Abraham? They're referring back to Abraham who lived 1,900 years before this event. Almost 2,000 years. Verse 58. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, How does he say it? I am. I am. And John has this unique thing in it, which is called the emphatic I am. Ego I me. We get the, Greek, we get the, the English word ego. You know what the word ego. All right. Ego is is a transliteration of the Greek ego. Ego is a pronoun which means I, me. But ego I me is an emphatic. I am that I am that I am. And that's what you've got here. Before Abraham was, I am that eternal, everlasting, almighty, absolute being. There's no way to re read it any other way, see. If this is not a claim to deity, I don't know what is. This is an absolute claim to deity in equality with the Father. I am. Now, of course, that enraged them. Verse number 59. Then took they up stones to cast, it, cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Then when you come to John chapter number 9 and verse 1, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This man is a type of Israel. Put that in the back of your mind somewhere. This man is a type of Israel, not just a sinner. We're all sinners. But this man is a type of Israel, okay? And so what you see unfold before you will show you in the sight of God how he sees Israel in that day 2,000 years ago. Verse 3, 
Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Now watch verse 5, and this is not easy to understand. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Is that true? Of course it is. But what's the condition? It's a conditional thing. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Remember what I told you before? How that we no longer know him after the flesh. Right? We no longer know Christ after the flesh. There's an awful lot of people in the liberal, in the liberal school who believe that, well, I'm going to live like Christ. I'm going to emulate his life. You know, I'm going to follow his teachings and so forth. That makes me a Christian. No, it doesn't. Amen. No, it doesn't. What makes you a Christian is to accept the blood covenant that was shed at Calvary. Amen. When the blood was shed for you, there he was the Lamb of God dying for the sins of the world. Amen. You're not saved by following or trying to live like Christ. That's, right. That's not going to save you. But we no longer know him after the flesh. All right. When the Lord Jesus said, now I've said this on Wednesday night in the last couple of weeks, two or three times. The Lord Jesus said, if you speak a word against the Son of Man, you can be forgiven. Talking about himself during his earthly ministry while he was here. But he said, if you, if you speak against the Holy Ghost, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Neither is there forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. That's a strong comparison between the two. So what do you mean by that? I mean by that, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to testify of the resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. Amen. And that, to reject that message, will seal your doom. And there's no forgiveness here in the world to come. That's what he's talking about. So here we have something that may very well be connected in a sense to that. Look at verse 5 again. Look at this carefully. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Do we have light now? Of course we do. But we don't have Christ in the world in the flesh like he was then 2,000 years ago, do we? But we have the Holy Ghost whose ministry is not to speak of himself but to speak of Christ. So what we have here is instead of a visible, physical person standing before us, we have a spiritual witness to the truth of who he is now. And that is as the glorified one at the right hand of the Father. So that's as important. Here's why it's important. He put that right here in John chapter number 9 when we're going to be dealing with a man born blind. Now the man is born physically blind. He cannot see with his physical eyes. All right. But the, but the, but the physical sight, the lack of physical sight is a type of of the lack of spiritual sight because the physical sight is, 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 is telling you that this is going to be applied to people who think they see but don't see. They don't really see like they think they do. And that's the catch to every unsaved man on the face of this earth because they are convinced and satisfied and smug in the idea that they are better than you they know more than you do, therefore they can see more clearly than you can. That's the elitist, condescending, patronizing attitude that you get from most people. I know more than you do. The fact of the matter is, though, when a man professes to be an agnostic, he's saying, I don't know. <laughs> because the word, that's what the word means. Let me tell you something about the world. The world is ever full of questions with no answers. Now mark that down. They are ever full of questions with no answers. The Bible says ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh, they have the questions. They'll doubt this, doubt that, question this, question that, but they have no answers. But let me tell you the answer. The Lord Jesus Christ is the answer. No question about it. Now let's look at the text here and see what's going on. Uh, the Bible says that he made a spittle verse 6, and took mud, and he put it on the eyes of the man. Now, what's that? Well, he took the dirt of the earth that is cursed and put it on his eyes. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. The earth is cursed. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. So he put the curse on the eyes of the man. 
How are you going to get that curse off? That's the key. What are you going to do? Well, he could have gone somewhere and washed in some pool somewhere and, and washed the dirt away or the mud away, but that wouldn't have done a thing for his sight. There's only one place he could go to to cleanse that curse from his eyes and allow him to see. Where is that? The pool of Siloam. And when he went to the pool of Siloam, and John interprets it for us, says the word means sent. Apostello is the Greek word that is translated apostle. Apostle is a sent one. Remember that. There's a vast difference between a disciple and an apostle. All disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ were not apostles. All apostles were disciples. A disciple is a follower, a learner of someone who is teaching. An apostle is one who is sent forth with power and authority. This is a theme that runs all the way through the Gospel of John that the Lord Jesus Christ is the sent one. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. It's not to say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke doesn't mention this, but it's emphasized in John. And uh, he's the sent one. So the pool of Siloam represents water that's coming from underneath the earth from the spring of Gihon. If you remember the Old Testament, uh, David said, take my son and take him to the pool of, uh, of uh, take Solomon to the pool of Gihon and there anoint him. And he was anointed as the king of Israel. The word Gihon means bursting forth, bubbling up out of the ground. Now, I preached a message a few years back called the Waters of Jerusalem. And when you look at the Waters of Jerusalem, you'll find a message attached to every one of them. The pool of Bethesda, for example, when the, when the man who was lame and halt had lain there for a long time, the angel of God would come down and trouble the waters, and whoever got in first would be healed. Well, the word Bethesda is a Hebrew word, and it means house of mercy, house of mercy. If you go to Jerusalem, your guide will take you to the very spot where the pool of Bethesda once stood. And you'll have to look way down into the ground to see the columns that were built around it and where it's located. The pool of Bethesda, house of mercy. So the waters of Siloam are the waters that flow softly. In the book of Isaiah, he said, you have abandoned the waters of Shiloh. That's, a, that's akin to Siloam. It's like Shiloh. These words are all akin to each other. And he said, you have abandoned the waters of Shiloh that flow softly, and you've gone after the waters of reason. In other words, you've gone away from the gentle moving and communication of the Holy Spirit of God, and you've run off out here to try to commune with the world and look to it for your authority and for your solace. So the waters of Siloam were, 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 were uh, and when Hezekiah was the king, he, uh, he, uh, he, he somehow or another detract, detracted, distracted them, caused them to move in a different direction, and brought them underneath the Temple Mount and dug a tunnel from both ends and joined together. And it talks about that in the Old Testament. And it's called the pool, the, the tunnel of Hezekiah. And it even talks about how that the pickaxe, they could hear each other coming together and then they connected. And once they connected, the waters of Shiloh or Siloam could run all the way underneath the Temple Mount and come and empty themselves out into the pool of Siloam. On the side of the wall, Hezekiah had them cut into that stone the message about how that they had done this and God led them to do it and it was accomplished and that is one of the greatest archaeological discoveries because it is called the Siloam Inscription. And it is written in Paleo-Hebrew. Paleo-Hebrew is the old Hebrew. Hebrew you see today are the square letters. How many have seen that? Square letter. Paleo-Hebrew are the letters that look, look, they don't look like, uh, uh, not so much like Arabic, but they're, Arabic but, they're, but they're shaped in a different fashion. It shows you the time element. It goes back into the past. It goes back to the time of Hezekiah. That Siloam inscription, uh, as the British have done with many things, they took that, cut it out of the wall, and it's in the British Museum in, uh, in England. And I think I remember it to be there. I, might, I might, be, might be mistaken, but I think that's where it is. And that Siloam inscription 
is another proof of the historicity and accuracy of the Bible because the Bible talks about the very same thing that took place when they, when they, when they engraved that in the stone. In other words, there was a Hezekiah, there was a, there was a tunnel dug, according to the scriptures. How many of you believe the Bible is accurate histori historically? I do. I believe the Bible's inspired. Amen. Amen. But anyway, the waters float down to the pool of Siloam. They know where that is. And they have, uh, they have been, in archaeology in the last few years, they have discovered a huge area, huge area. They've discovered that since I was over there the last time, a huge area that comprised the pool of Siloam. So the Lord said, go down to Siloam and wash in that water that comes from Gihon that flows underneath the Temple Mount that Hezekiah dug the tunnel and emptied it into the pool of Siloam, which means sent, like the apostle is sent with the power of God from above. Go wash in that water and you'll come seeing. And he did. And when he washed in that water, it washed his eyes and he came seeing. It took a supernatural intervention from God for the blind man to be able to see. And when he saw, his seeing was in stages. The first thing he saw was with a physical eye. But he wound up seeing more than all the rest of them around him. Because once they'd kicked him out of the temple, they excommunicated him. And because he wouldn't agree with them and sing their song, and the Lord Jesus found him and says, dost thou believe on the Son of Man? Not a, you know, nobody going to catch me on that? What's it say in your Bible? What's it say in a real Bible? <laughs> Son of God. You said, oh, wait a minute, preacher. Well, oh, wait. You go dig it up and do the research into it, and you'll find that a lot of ancient authorities say Theos, or uh, 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 Son of God, Theos, instead of uh, anthropos or son of man, weos, I forget which word it is. In plainer words, there's a lot of ancient authority before the King James Bible was ever translated that has God. And there are some ancient authorities that has man. So you can make your choice. Which one's it going to be? Well, I'm going to choose God. Say so why? Because in John chapter number 9, the Lord Jesus Christ made it clear I am the Son of God. And they're teaching people today that nowhere in the Bible does the Lord Jesus Christ ever claim to be the Son of God. Look for yourself in John chapter number 9. Verse 39. Jesus heard they'd cast him out, and when he'd found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said to him, Now this is as plain as it can be, folks. This is sixth grade English. Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. All right. Notice the progression to his belief, to his state of spiritual belief. I believe, he said, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come to this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Now here is the, this is the crux of this ninth chapter. Because he sees when he accepts the light that God gives him. He follows that light and it leads to more light. Right? first light he got, he got eyesight, physical light. He followed that light, and what happened? He got more light. And, and the further light that he got brought him to a state of salvation. And now the Lord says this to the Pharisees standing by. Judgment I am come to the world, they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. So what's the point? If we don't get this last verse correct, correctly, if we don't get it right, we're going to miss the whole message of John 9. Did he say they would be sinless? No. That's not what he said. The scripture is clear. For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God, and Adam all die. So what's he saying? He said you would not have the sin of rejecting me and rejecting the light. 
That's the message of John 9, rejecting the truth and rejecting the light. The Bible says in John chapter number 1, He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now you wouldn't believe how the Greek translations mess with that. Coming into the world, He's the light that lighteth all men. They change it completely. And the reason they do is because they can't, they can't understand how that Christ can be the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. But he certainly is according to Scripture. Do I understand the full implications of that? No. But I'm going to take God at his word. And I'm going to take it, and, and I'm, not going to, I'm not going to take the path of the Quaker. Now what's the path of the Quaker? What did the Quaker believe? Everybody's had uh, oatmeal. What is it? The... Uh, uh, <laughs> I eat it every day. Uh, forget, what is it? Uh, Quaker Oats. Isn't that what it is? And there's a Quaker on the front of it there. William Penn was a Quaker. Started Pennsylvania's place of religious freedom. They'd been persecuted. So why were they persecuted? What's the deal about a Quaker? Well, the word quake. See, the word quake has to do with something that they did. And uh, I just happened upon a site the other day. It was a Quaker, modern-day Quaker site. And, they were, and they were, I was looking at their, their services. And, uh, and they had services set aside there and, and a couple of places that were talking about, uh, see if I can remember what it was, waiting, uh, something about where they come together and they, and, they, and they spend some time in contemplation and waiting. Now, this is not to be critical. This is to be observant. You see, a Quaker believes that every man has a divine spark. There's a spark in him. There's a certain amount of light in him. And what he needs is for the Holy Spirit to come and enlighten that or fan that light and cause that light to, uh, to, uh, to, to begin to manifest itself in the man's life. Well, now, I don't believe that you have divine light deposited in you at birth, but I do believe that divine light must come to you or you never will see the light. I certainly believe that. I believe without question. And uh, they were persecuted for that reason, you'd be amazed at how many things happened in this country, how many places were settled out of direct, as a direct result of religious persecution. John William, Roger Williams, for example, he was cast out into the wilderness among the Indians. And Roger Williams, the reason, reason he was cast out in the wilderness among the Indians is because he refused infant baptism. And he believed that salvation was by grace through faith. He believed in the blood covenant. And so eventually he wound up in a place and they called it providence by the providential hand of God. They called it providence. And it, uh, I think it's the capital now of the state. Providence, Rhode Island. Exactly. It was all as a product of being persecution, religious persecution. Religious persecution. So the ninth chapter of John, right smack in the middle of the book, lays out for you the whole idea of the Jew because of what, God, what's God, what, God, what is God going to do with the Jew? Now let me ask you a question. If God is going to do something with the Jew, then what does that do for your eschatology? You've got to get it right. If you are an amillennial or postmillennial, you've got a problem with that. You see, you've got a problem with that. If you're premillennial, you don't have a problem with that. Well, so how does that relate? Well, premillennial means that Christ is going to come. He's going to get us out of this place. And then he's going to reign for a thousand years on this earth. The Bible said in Revelation, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They're going to reign. He's going to reign for a thousand years. During that thousand year period of time, the Jew is going to be elevated once again to the head of all the nations. Is going, to be he is going to be elevated. The last few chapters of the book of Ezekiel talk about that, and they talk about how that the tribes come back into the land of Israel, and all of them have their apportion, uh, their, their land apportion, apportioned to them, and that Christ is going to sit in Jerusalem, and he's going to reign over this earth for a thousand years. Now, that's a literal period of time. This is where we get the idea of millennium. Mill annum, thousand years, two, two Latin words. I believe that there's going to be a literal period of a thousand years on this earth where Christ reigns. He's going to reign. 
And when he reigns, you're going to reign with him. You're going to reign with him. The Bible says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right. But when is Israel going to be saved then? That's right. Look over here in Romans chapter number 11. Verse number 25, from verse 25 through verse 36, very, very, very important as it relates to Israel, which is the key to understanding the New Testament. I would not have you to be, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, verse 25, Romans 11, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the deliverer, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now when you see that 27th verse, just go to the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and that's exactly what it's talking about. As concerning the gospel, they are what? They're enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Now, you know, we've quoted that scripture and applied it in a thousand different ways, and that's all fine. But in the context, it has to do with Israel. For as ye in times past have not believed, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Amen. Now look at this. Here is this man of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised according to the law of Moses, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Look what he says in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. He's shouting, folks. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it should be recompensed to him again? For of him, through him, to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. In other words, he's very satisfied with what God's going to do with the Jew. He is. Now, this is not an unconditional salvation of every individual. This has to do with the salvation, the resurrection of the nation as a nation, as an ethnos, a nation. We get the word ethnic, ethnicity. Where are you from? You know. It has to do with them, with the Jews. Revelation chapter number 7. Turn over here with me. Revelation 7. And verse number four, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the church. See how people try to ram that in there? This is where Judge Rutherford and uh, the ones who started the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that 144,000 are super, super saints sealed that are going to be in heaven. And the charter members, yeah, <laughs> charter members. And all the rest of us will just find us a place here on the earth. you got to go a long way, folks, to, to make it say that, don't you? It's, you're better off just leaving it the way it, let it say what it's saying. Amen. All right, now here they are in chapter number 7. He seals them, and he mentions the tribes on down through here. And... Uh, then in chapter number 14, verse number 1, he said, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having their father's name written in their foreheads. That's the same group. The first time they show up, they're on the earth. See? 
They're on the earth. The next time they show up, they're on the heavenly Mount Zion. Now these, these are, uh, they're representative of Israel, no question about that. But they're representative of Israel in a little deeper sense than you normally see. So what is that? Well, Israel is going to go through the tribulation period. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what it's called. Not the time of the church's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. And during this period of time, God's going to do some weeding out. He's going to weed out certain, uh, certain groups of Jews. This is what Matthew 24 is talking about when you've got five wise and five foolish virgins. At midnight the cry goes forth, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. All right, who's he coming? He's coming for Israel, coming for the Jews, not the church. There's nothing about midnight and the bridegroom coming for the church. Any time, at any moment, he can come and get us. But he's coming to the Jews, he's coming to them, and some of them are going to be ready and some of them are not going to be ready. The point of the tribulation period is to rearrange Israel and get them ready to go into the millennium and purge out the rebels and have those who are ready and willing to receive their Messiah to receive him. And they're going to receive him. They're going to have 144,000 male Jewish virgins, never known a woman. They're going to be preaching during this period of time you got three distinct uh, sources of a message coming in the tribulation period. You've got Moses and Elijah, if they're the two witnesses of Revelation 11, that are preaching. You've got an angel flying through heaven, through the heavens, on this earth, preaching the everlasting gospel. Repent and give glory to God. Then you've got 144,000 male Jewish virgins that are preaching. Now, who would they be preaching to? They certainly would be. If they're raised up from the 12 tribes of Israel, and it names all the tribes here, there's a couple of tribes that don't show up in here, and there's a reason they don't. They're replaced by uh, the sons of Joseph. There's a reason for that. We don't want to get into that right now. They're preaching this message, and they're getting these people ready for the coming of the Lord, for the coming of the Messiah. Now, if you look over there in Revelation chapter number 11, you'll find Moses and Elijah preaching. And they preach for half of the tribulation period. A half of it. Then they're put to death. And then after three days, their bodies come up. And the voice from heaven says, come up hither. And they go up just like it says in Revelation 4 when John is caught up into the third heaven. Come up hither. This is a rapture. This is a catching up of the saints right smack in the middle of the tribulation period. It's a rapture. This is where a lot of people get the idea that the church is going to go into the middle of the tribulation and then there they're going to be raptured up to meet the Lord. Amen. What they're doing is confounding or confusing tribulation saints with the church age saints and they're not the same. You can get in big trouble when you start doing that because it's going to mess up a lot of stuff for you. They're caught up in the middle of the tribulation, Moses and Elijah. That's who I think the two witnesses are. And they're caught up. And the word, come up hither, they, they go up to meet him in the clouds to meet the Lord, a mid-tribulation rapture. The 144,000 male Jewish virgins are preaching to Israel. They're preparing them for the coming of the Messiah because the second time you see them, they are in heaven. They're up there with the Lord. What takes place before the end of the tribulation, right before the second advent of Christ? The marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. That's when the family of God, the whole family of God, is gathered together to sit down and the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church is there, but all of the others that make up the family of God are there as witnesses, you see. How big is the family of God? Well, you've got the saints that were before the law and before the flood, the ones who lived under the, what's called the time of conscience, then it moved to human government. Then it moved to law. Then it's in the age of grace that we're living in now. Then you've got tribulation saints and millennial saints. Then you move into eternity. During these periods of time, people are going to be saved that belong to the Lord. But the only people that have ever been born again are the saints 
that were born at the beginning of the New Testament, Hebrews 9, that make up the church of God right now, nobody before that was ever born again. Nobody. It doesn't make a difference how you try to force it. Nobody. Because without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. And he said, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and uh, instituted the Lord's Supper. So you've got saints of the Old Testament where he led captivity captive, gave gifts to men who were carried up to be with the Lord. You've got all these other things that have happened, but only the church, only the church for the last 2,000 years have been born again. So what does that mean for us? That means that you have the very image of God. You have the new birth. You have the life of God. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus, and you can never lose your salvation because you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption and that you will reign with him for a thousand years right here on this earth. And that time is going to come and probably be here sooner than most people think. Sooner than they think. you got passages in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, for example, that say, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. You got passages in the book of Hebrews that says it is impossible to renew them again in repentance seeing they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. You've got passages in the Bible, in the New Testament, that when you read them, it looks like it is saying you better be careful because you can lose what you have. You can lose your salvation. There's an awful lot of good people out there, brothers and sisters that I love dearly, who believe that you can lose your salvation. And they base it on these scriptures. Now here's the problem. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. But all scripture is not written directly to you. It's not written directly to you. There are passages of scripture that are written to people during that period of time that it applies to them. When he said that I seal you with the Holy Spirit and you're sealed in my hand and no man can pluck you from my hand and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. You see. When I first got saved, I had a struggle with that because when I first got saved, I had any problem believing that I was saved forever. Then I started hearing people who started talking to me and they were, they were trying to show me in the scripture how I could lose my salvation. Well, believe me, folks, if you've only been saved six months to a year, there's an awful lot you need to learn. <laughs> a lot. And I had no idea back then of the, of the breadth of the Scripture, of, what a, of what, how, how big an area, how long a time, an expansive time that it covers into all the people that it's talking to. You make a huge mistake. If you try to take somebody singing in the church today that's a member of the body of Christ that's born again and start preaching to them out of the book of Ecclesiastes as if that is relevant, straight to them, written for them, at that time, you're going to make a big mistake. The book of Ecclesiastes has much spiritual truth for you. But the book of Ecclesiastes is not written to you. The book of Ecclesiastes is written during the time of Solomon to the people living in the time of Solomon. And he said, what is the whole duty of man? When he, he comes to conclusion, what's the whole duty of man? Fear God and do what? And keep his commandments. If I got up in front of you this morning and said, here's the gospel. Fear God and keep his commandments. You say, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it, but that's not the gospel. If you've got the gospel and if you've really believed and you really are born again, you're going to fear God. And if you're really born again, you're going to want to keep his commandments. That's just like saving faith. If you have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to repent. And that's proof to you that you've got saving faith. It's because you want to repent. Don't ever let anybody tell you that repentance is not part of, uh, of New Testament salvation. It's the heart and soul of it because it's proof to you and to me and anyone else who truly believes that you really did believe with saving faith. And your repentance is not going to stop in one day. You're going to repent for years. <laughs> you just start repenting. You're going to be a repenter, believe me. 
once you have truly been born again. All right, well, we'll pick it up again next week and uh, try to move along a little bit. And hopefully it won't confuse everybody and mess around and stumble and get lost and, and probably try to stay in the book. Amen. <laughs> Brother Ronnie Crane, will you dismiss us, please?